what an opportune time to talk to you about obesity and diabetes just right after you finish your <laughs> Doritos <laughs> and Big Red. But I hope I don't cause you any indigestion. But we need to know the truth. The purpose of my talk is not to tell you that we have a serious problem with obesity and diabetes. The purpose of my talk is to show you that we have evidence that we can stop and control these disease. And lastly, to tell you why aren't we implementing these solutions. But to understand the problem, to understand the disease, we need to understand the costs. A fat cell is like a rubber band. A fat cell in our body. They expand and they contract. And to our knowledge, to our scientific knowledge, there's four periods in life. There's only four periods in life where this fat cell goes through an expansion and then a contraction. And it's real important that we know this and understand this, because if we know this, we can raise healthier children. And when you see the red bar up there, those are children that will go through those four phases where that fat cell expands and then contracts. And those children, will grow up to be lean and healthy and free of diabetes. But there's another group of children whose fat cell expands but doesn't contract. Those are the yellow bar. And those children will grow up to be obese and probably develop diabetes with all its complications. But what distinguishes one group of children that are going to grow up to be lean and healthy and another group of children that are going to grow up to be obese and probably develop diabetes? Well, it has nothing to do with ethnicity or race. All children are created equal. Well, what is it then? Well, let's understand. The four periods where that fat cell expands and contracts is in uterus, when the fetus is in between 25 and 27 weeks, and then it shrinks back again. The second period, when the child is born, to the age of one, that second wave of expansion and contraction. The third period between the age of four and the age of six, another expansion and contraction. And the fourth period is at the age of nine. And it's very important that we understand this because if we don't understand this, we can harm and ruin the life of a child. So what is going on during those four periods? Is it genetics? Is it something that's inborn? Or is it something that's in the environment that's causing this? That first period, between 25 and 27 weeks, is when taste buds develop in the uterus, in the, in the fetus. Studies show that if mothers are eating broccoli and drinking water, 
more likely that taste buds will grow up to favor broccoli and water. But if the mother is eating Doritos, <laughs> and Dr. Pepper, that the taste buds of that fetus more likely to be for Doritos and Dr. Pepper. So here you have the environment. It's like a thumbprint pushing that wave, flatten it, so that the child grows up like that yellow bar. The second phase, the child is born, newborn. And studies show that if mothers breastfeed, the child more likely to be lean, healthy. But if the mother is giving cow milk and powdered formula, the child more likely to be obese. And I'm, and I'm saying we can harm the rest of the life of the child, and I will tell you who is we in a while. The third phase, between the age of four and the age of seven, another physiological wave that we need to respect and understand so that this child grows up to be healthy and lean and free and never have diabetes. So what happens at the age of four, the age of five? At the age of four is when these little babies grab a chair and they drag it and they put it in front of the TV. And, and all of a sudden, TV becomes their most important caretaker, tutor, teacher, parent. And what is TV? TV, first of all, is sedentary. It's a sedentary lifestyle. The second thing, what are the commercials? Fat, sugar, and beer. <laughs> so here you have these babies, these children born innocent. And we, given them, the adults, given them all the wrong messaging. So here comes the fourth period. Nine years of age. Strange. I reviewed the literature in the world from the Middle East, from Africa, from Europe, from Asia, from the US, from Latin America. At the age of nine, all children in the world, their physical activity starts going down, starts decreasing their level of physical activity. We know for sure in the United States, physical education is provided in most elementary schools, but we know that when they get to middle schools and high school, it's taken away, no more physical activity. So here you have parents, schools, commerce, government, all of us giving these children the wrong messaging. We are programming diabetes and obesity in these innocent children. So it's not a gene, it's the environment, it is we. And if it's the environment, we need to change the environment, we need to modify the environment. So far I've talked to you about the size of a fat cell. I haven't talked to you about the numbers of fat cells. So far so good, you know why? Because a fat cell size, when we lose weight in January, we have this guilt and we want to lose weight, we can shrink a fat cell size. When we lose weight, that's what we do, we shrink a fat cell size. But these children growing up 
if their fat cell size starts expanding and doesn't contract physiologically and it continues expanding, it triggers an incessant proliferation of fat cell numbers. Look at the yellow bar compared to the red bar. So obesity is like cancer. It's a proliferation of abnormal cells. The problem with these is that once you make them, you can't get rid of them. You, you can't get rid of them. So it's all being programmed developmentally at a very young age. We need to change the environments of the children. We need to change the environments of the children. The four environments, the Bienestar NIMA Health Curriculum, been around since 1997. Developing these kindergarten through eighth grade curriculums. And the four environments is home, It's their food service. These kids are eating two meals in our cafeterias. Physical education and health education are the four environments that have a big influence on children's health behaviors. So these are structured curriculums that operate in the schools and their kindergarten through eighth grade. We know the science. So when we apply the science, these curriculums, Bienestar, meaning well-being in Spanish, NIMA, well-being in Swahili, because these are the children that are, not because they're black or, or, or Latino, but because they happen to be overrepresented in the poverty category. Diabetes, obesity is three times more common in children living in poverty. So, so these curriculums, we implemented them. These are eight-year-olds, and we were able to decrease their blood sugars. These are that red bar, eight-year-olds. And the, we had 13 schools in the program, 13 schools not in the program. The kids in the program, we decreased their blood sugars. We were able to increase their physical activity, and we were able to increase dietary fiber. The children not in the program, their blood sugars went up, their physical activity went down, and their dietary fiber went down. Again, significant findings. Astonishing that children as young as eight could modify their health to improve their biological markers. Another big study we published in the New England Journal of Medicine just came out in July. Big study, 6,000 children, 3,000 children in our curriculums, and another 3,000 not in the curriculums, we were able to decrease obesity prevalence. We were able to decrease our body mass index, an indicator of adiposity. We were able to decrease our waist circumference. And we were able to decrease our insulin levels, that protein that metabolizes and regulates glucose. So we know the science. And we have the instruments that can stop and control diabetes. By, but why aren't we implementing these solutions? We operate these curriculums in a society where profits are tied to disease. The sicker the population, the higher the profits. For 10 years, this industry lobbied bureaucrats and politicians in the state of Texas to keep these curriculums away from these high-risk children. I wrote the book, Forgotten Children, A True Story How Politicians Endanger Children, plural, because the names on this book is on both sides. There's segments on both sides of the fence that forget who they represent. And when the money flows, they march to that tune. So in conclusion, we have a serious problem. 
It won't be enough money in all our government buildings, all our medical centers, all our universities to pay what's coming at us. But we have a solution. But it is very difficult to operate in a society where, again, the profits are tied to disease. So in this book, it's a battle between politics and science. In the short of it, I am still standing here. And the school program continues growing. And in November, who knows who's going to have the politics. Thank you.